Do you know what would happen first here? You would have um, you would have a nucleophilic attack with the hydrogen. Okay, good. That is correct. Let's try drawing that. That's correct. Yeah, so technically we would call that a hydride. We consider a negative hydrogen to be a hydride. <laughs> I, I forget how to draw the structure for this one. Okay. Is it just an aluminum molecule surrounded by four hydrogens and an ionically bound lithium? That sounds like what you were describing. That's right. This is a pretty common reagent, so yeah, we should memorize this structure. The lithium here is just a counter ion. A, a neutral aluminum would only be bonded to three things. So an aluminum with the fourth thing has a negative charge. Do you remember what the name for this is in words? That would be lithium aluminum hydride. Lithium aluminum hydride. Hydride, well, lithium for the lithium, aluminum for the aluminum, and hydride as an indication that this is basically a source of H minus. Now, who's going to be the nucleophilic atom here? Who's the nucleophilic atom in this mix? The hydrogen. Right. And not the aluminum, yeah. But the hydrogen. We, we've seen before why that is. Um, even though this has a negative charge, we've said that if something has a negative charge and a lone pair, it's going to be a nucleophile. But if something has a negative charge without a lone pair, it's the adjacent atom that's the nucleophile. Negative charge plus a lone pair makes so, you into a nucleophile, but negative charge with no lone pair makes the adjacent atom the nucleophile. And where is the hydrogen going to get the electrons from that it's going to be donating? That's right. That's something that's difficult for people to remember. That's right. The aluminum here has no lone pairs, so the negative charge doesn't actually make the aluminum into a nucleophile. The rule is that if you've got a negative charge and no lone pairs, it's the adjacent atom as the nucleophile, and it acts like the nucleophile by donating from its bond. That was uh, covered in the, uh, the reactivity handout we talked about a little bit last term. Okay, so this is really a source of H minus. charge rate. Now there's going to be an additional hydrogen here. You could leave the hydrogen out and treat it like a hidden hydrogen, but maybe it's just as well to show it, to show what the changes that are happening here. You could show the lithium counter ion here. And now there's also the neutral aluminum H3. In reality, that there's one or two extra steps that happen here, but we, we don't need to get in, into those details. At this point, let's just think about what would happen when we add the H3O+. So let's think about what would be the result of now adding H3O plus to this. Don't forget the positive charge on the lithium. That's the reason why it's countering the negative charge on the oxygen. Don't forget the positive charge on the H3O plus. Oh, yeah. final product. Yeah. Good. That's right. It's always good to ask what types of functional groups we've created. You could just as well write it like this. It's not necessary to show the hidden hydrogen, but maybe it's helpful so we can see what changes are happening here. But either of these would be acceptable. So the key thing is that lithium aluminum hydride is a source of nucleophilic hydrogens. It's a source of nucleophilic hydrogens. 
We've slightly oversimplified this mechanism, but, but this is this is good enough for, for most purposes in OCAM. So this is all we really need to know. Now, how's that been a carboxylic acid? Would we still get the nucleophile attack from the hydrogen? Um, that is an excellent question. In fact, that's what we're going to be getting to in a second. We'll get to that. Uh, we'll get to that in one second. That, um, that's a really good uh, question to pose there. Obviously, we're just backtracking a little here because the main thing we're focusing on is carboxylic acid. So we'll definitely get to that in a moment. That's a very important question. But first, we had to review how would lithium aluminum hydride react with a ketone. And by the way, it shouldn't surprise us that it would have worked the same way with an aldehyde. You know that aldehydes and ketones react the same way. So, what lithium aluminum hydride turns aldehydes and ketones into what type of functional group? Alcohol. Into alcohols. So this is a brief um, stepping back to aldehydes and ketones. So therefore, we should be thinking about which of the four categories this fell into. This is the complete reaction right here. Well, this is the complete reaction. Was this a category one, two, three, or four reaction? It's a category one. Yeah, category one. We saw that category one is when a single nucleophilic atom attacks once. Well, here we have a single hydrogen attacking once, and that's the end of the story. And, and then this is, um, yeah, this, right? Yeah. So this is a category one that we didn't have a chance to talk about before. We covered what happens when a Grignard attacks an aldehyde or a ketone. Well, that's basically when an R minus attacks. Well, this is very similar, except that it's basically an H minus attack rather than an R minus. This is an important reaction on its own that we just didn't have time for before, so you should know about this uh, anyway. When would you use a Grignard when you want to make an alcohol with more carbons than the original aldehyde or ketone? When you should, should you use a hydride when you want to make an alcohol with the same number of carbons? So um, you wouldn't want to use a Grignard here unless you wanted to add carbons. This is a way to get the alcohol without changing the number of carbons. This is not a reversible reaction. We've seen that many of the attacks in aldehydes and ketones are reversible, and, but this isn't. And the reason is, once the H joins, there's no way it's going to leave. H minus can be a nucleophile, but we've never seen a hydrogen leaving group. So this is, since the hydrogen can't be a leaving group, these are not reversible reactions. So we wouldn't really think of this as a hidden carbonyl. We can't go backwards. And it does make sense that this is going to be category one with only one attack. Because after the first attack, there's a negative charge, so this is not electrophilic anymore. And after we add the H3O+, plus, there's no negative charge anymore, but that's really going to destroy the hydride at the same time. Anyway, we'll just memorize this as category one. Why do you think we had to add the H3O plus separately from the lithium aluminum hydride? It's the same issue as for Grignards, although we haven't talked about this much. Just like H3O plus would destroy a Grignard, it also would destroy the lithium aluminum hydride. The hydride would, refer, would react with the hydronium before it gets to react with the, with the ketones. So we need to have memorized that just like with the Grignard, these have to be in separate steps. By the way, this would give us the same product. This is sodium borohydride. Sodium borohydride would give us the same product. And are they in the same um, column? Are, are is the same? and boron? That's a good question. I believe they are. That's right. I'm just trying to figure out why that's a good that's point. Why they're good. Yeah, that's why. So sodium borohydride yes. would have a similar structure. It would be the same deal, where even though the negative charge is on the boron, since it doesn't have any lone pairs, it's really the hydrogen that's the nucleophile, and it gets the electrons out of the bond here. So the first step would be the same in both cases. And you're right. The reason why they react similarly is that boron and aluminum are in the same column. That's a good analysis. Things in the same column tend to behave similarly. We won't go through the whole mechanism here to save time, but it's very similar to this one up here. The big difference is sodium borohydride is a little less reactive. It's less reactive than lithium aluminum hydride. Therefore, you can put it in a protic solvent. This would have to be in an aprotic solvent, like maybe THF, which is an ether. This has to be in an aprotic solvent, like THF, like a Grignard. But sodium borohydride could be put in water or alcohol. So notice that I didn't number these one and two. I put in a comma, meaning these are the same steps. So what would happen here is the sodium borohydride would attack, and then we would just use the alcohol to protonate. Then we could just use the alcohol to protonate. We don't need a whole separate step where we add this H3O+. 
But besides that technical detail, you get the same outcomes here. So it's worth knowing sodium borohydride is similar to but less reactive than the lithium aluminum hydride. The borohydride is similar but less reactive than the lithium aluminum hydride. And one result of that is that you have to keep the lithium aluminum hydride away from acids and, well, away from protic solvents. But you can dissolve the sodium borohydride in the protic solvent and it won't be destroyed. But we still get a category one reaction here. Okay. They both give us a category one attack on the aldehyde or the ketone. So that reaction is important in and of itself, and it will also be helpful to us now that we move on to carboxylic acids.